recording. So um, welcome again to this, our June meeting of uh, the Emerging Centers track. Um, we're very glad to have you. Thanks for signing in on the sign-in sheet. Um, we wanted to take this time as a little bit of a, a lull for some folks as the semester is over, some are starting up. Uh, seems like a lot of people are doing travel and, and getting around, but we have a little bit of a, a quiet time right now maybe, but we did wanna talk about future topics um, for the Emerging Centers track and figure out ways uh, uh, the ways to reach out to new facilitators or bring in new topics that people want to see um, here. So um, Jane had set up a um, a survey, um, and we actually have one of our respondents here, who's who's responded to the survey, Jeff Dusenberry. Um, and actually, first off the off the bat. Um, so I want to give Jeff the opportunity to talk as much as he wants to, because he was good enough to fill out our survey. Um, but we would definitely welcome other ideas as we go. I'm going to try and take notes. Um, so if I appear scattered uh, or more scattered than usual, it's because I'm trying to, to note everything down. Um, so Jeff, um, you had a number of topics in your survey response. You want to walk us through them? Uh Sure. Uh, was I actually the only one who responded to a survey? Um, yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> Maybe one of the topics would be how to get other responses. So um, I can't remember exactly what I said. I think one of the things on there was talking about culture, uh, something that specifically, it's come up in, in like uh, Henry Neiman's uh, virtual residency, stuff like that. Just kind of talking about strategies for dealing with how people deal with cultural differences between research and central IT or between research computing and central IT, because those can, can be fairly different um, ideas of what people find important. Enterprise IT is very big on stability, the five nines, all of that. Research IT tends to be a little more cutting edge and people just wanna get their jobs done and get it done quickly without a lot of delays. Um, I think I said something about talking about building trust. And you did. so that would be kind of a second idea. Um, so uh, building trust in two ways. One would be building trust with your researchers. And the other one would be building trust, well, actually three ways, building trust between research computing support and your researchers, building trust between research computing and central IT. And then the third one will be between central IT and your researchers. So trying to get those three different components. Um, getting the researchers obviously to trust central IT, but can also get in central IT to trust research. Um, we'll just, it, that may just be my institution, but that is something that's definitely come up here. That is something we need to talk about. Um, I, I think would be good to talk about. It could be of interest. I, I think we were talking about it a little bit on the lead into this call in terms of how do we how do we make sure we have enough leeway for folks to get their work done and still meet some of the compliance requirements um, and ensure that compliance doesn't sort of take over on the same, you know, by the same token and restrict people from from getting their activities done. So. I think that's it's I mean it's really salient we were we were just sort of discussing it um informally as we were setting up starting up this call so uh I think I think that's definitely um a good topic the, I think the other one you noted was the getting buy-in from leadership and and uh strategic planning if you want to um elaborate a little bit on that I think this is something we covered before I, I know it's been covered in some of those CUG sessions um, I just think it's a good topic to go in to, to review or to, to refresh about just strategies for um, con convincing central IT leadership and even your campus leadership of the value of the stuff that we're doing and um, the value to our research community and just showing the, the the value that's out there and getting their buy-in on that, particularly for senior IT who don't understand uh, research computing. 
a senior leadership that don't really understand research computing. Yeah, I think that that is a, would be a really interesting topic because there's a there's a lot of strategies for capturing that value and bringing it back um, to to the organization and showing you know whether it's dollars supported or publication number of publications or number of researchers or cycles delivered. You know, there's a really good range of things uh, that you can cover to talk about what you're, you know, what a particular organization is providing back to the institution. So I think I think that's a that's a really good topic. And we could I think we could um, potentially sort of um, put something together where people contribute, you know, contribute what they're doing locally to to reflect what they do, you know, here at uh at Center for Advanced Computing, um, what we what we generally try to focus on is, you know, what researchers, how much, how many, um, how many dollars are they involved with, if we can, to to make sure that it's it's clear that we're focusing on the the institution and supporting it. I mean, and and that's really our sort of our value proposition. Um, but I think there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different approaches depending on how the center is set up within the organization. I think one of the challenges we face is actually having that data, being able to get the connections through other parts of the university and stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot, stuff, lot going on there. Okay. Um, other other folks, in terms of what they'd like to see out of the EC track, what are um, important issues that that you would like to see discussed or areas? You know, one of the things that we've focused on, um, I think, is trying to develop some deliverables for the participants, so people have templates or stubs or you know guidelines for doing you know working things on their own, or they don't have to always keep coming up with their own stuff. Um, that we can sort of borrow from each other and and sort of streamline activities. So if you if you've got you know ideas for what you need in that vein, we would really love to hear them. Um, are there other areas where folks would like to hear uh, some discussion, hear from other other institutions, or have us bring someone in? One charge that I've been given is to um, look at a federal cost recovery center and so uh, a workshop on different pricing models the process of becoming a federal cost recovery center um i think you richard actually when i asked you you have some some pointers um i think that would be a, a valuable add um partially i think on the flip side of you know what's the um the return on investment this is how to invest right is how do we charge for or um, make that work yeah we we have it easy um we've we've been doing cost recovery for well over 10 years at this point and our our return is that we we're not allowed to make a profit so we have to just recover as much as we're doing uh with our subsidies so we can we can slightly over recover but we can't ever really um you know show show that people are making massive profits on what we do we have, mm -hmm. everything gets put back into the organization so it makes a lot of sense yeah so i think that's one where um you know part of me wants to say okay um, I have researchers who want to um, pay money, but our business people for the IT organization like, no, 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 then no, don't do that um, because they're not geared for that. Um, but I think this is one where how does one allow people with money give money and people without money to still get access to the sources of like, you know, what... Uh, one of my bosses used to call fungible funds, where we would allocate a block of money, money, um, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, um, to fund their research for like the doctoral students or 
and not making it a, you know, cash on delivery. I hope it's not Bitcoin this week. Yeah. True. Well, now it's time to, to get those. So Mike had a, had a good uh, note in chat of how people have bootstrapped their own organizations from sort of nothing. Um, and I've, I'm noting it in the call doc, but I think that might be an interesting, you know, uh, opportunity to, to, to sort of everybody bring their story to the fireside and, and we all sort of share of how did, you know, how did your institution get established? Um, what did you end up, what, what did you end up doing? What strategies have you done? Um, so there's, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of good things to learn from there. Okay, other ideas, things that people would wanna hear. You know, we, we've gone around in, I think, Slack before, but the formation and utilization of advisory boards. Um, so right now, I before I got here, we had an advisory board, but it was one of those administratively picked versus a user group, which, would be getting the you know tails from the ground so i think that might be a good discussion of advisory boards and advocacy right who who how do you marshal your big pis to go to administration what letters of support do you have things like that yeah, that's a I, that that makes a lot of sense, and it's a complex topic because you want you want good feedback, right? That's going to help you move forward. Uh, it's easy to bring in folks who are going to make you know who who want who show up with the you know list of of demands and and want to talk about all the things that they want to do, but you really do need to identify people who can advocate and and sort of sort of help bolster the organization as well. So it's a it's a trade-off um, a lot of times. And I think the other thing that, that what I'm seeing from an, a couple of other centers um, that I'm familiar with is they also partner, they also bring in folks from sort of partner organizations um, to help provide uh, either, you know, a maybe a moderating influence or like a, this, well, this is how we do it over here or, or things like that um, so that, when you know there there's a there's an opportunity to talk about sort of the the bigger context and, and make things work so mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's that would be a good uh, discussion oh. and I see Tom uh, has got some stuff in our slack channel too thanks Tom that helps because I don't lose it at the end of the call uh, yeah metrics um, I think that's a Definitely a good one. I think one of the, so with with that and and something that's been on my mind, we're we're having some changes in leadership um, here at Cornell. And previously, we done like every center has done an annual report to the to the vice provost for research, and it has you know sets sets of metrics. Every year they change, so so the good news is there's no tracking from one year to the next um but there is sort of an overview statement and, and figuring out like okay so how do you you know if, if you're going to provide um an annual you know this is what we've done for you lately what would that look like and figure out how to what's the structure of that for your organization how would it you know what do you want to highlight how would you want to make it work um a lot of times we have to remind leadership you know how we're structured and, and what you know what are the services we even offer? Um, just because we're not, you know, we're just not that top of mind um, the, uh, uh, across the organization. I found so. Well, and I think that would be a, a good collaboration of how do you peel your Slurm database for, you know, number of active accounts, um, number of hours chewed, and you know, I think that sort of feeds into the cost recovery, but maybe 
we break it down into a different couple of pieces, which are key performance indices. You know, what, you know, we've added five new projects or 50 new researchers. Um, you know, we, our storage uh, demands grown uh, because I think those are the forecast, like forecasting success statistics and how do we do it? Um, because the other thing I was thinking about is benchmarking. Um, do I want to com compare myself against TAC or OSC? No, I can't. But where do I fit in a high R2 category or, or aspirational? Um, you know, the number of staff, the number of, you know, nodes, the number of disks, whatever. Yeah, we used to call that the speeds and feeds report at one of my mm -hmm. old institutions so that you can provide, you can provide that and then leadership can recycle that when they want to talk about how, you know, how fantastic they are. If you have this, you know, it's, it's always obviously, um, you know, the infrastructure is always changing, um, but being able to, to have that so that leadership can leverage that when they want to talk it up or when they want to recruit new faculty or, or do other things like that, it can be very beneficial for them. And so we actually have one of my guys um, tracks the number of times we're cited in papers. There's <laughs> yeah, that's I mean yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty good thing to keep an eye on, right? No, because then we can say we we assisted, you know, our resources were critical in the production of 52 papers or whatever it is. Um, I think we're in double digits, but I don't know exactly how many, you know, how many theses were uh, based on the work. Because I think those are the other things of what tools like using cold front. Uh, right now I'm working on a uh, NSF proposal and it's like, what are your science drivers? Well, now I got to like recreate it from six different forms and all of that. If I had cold front up and running, I'd be able to pull it a little better. But then that would be one to send to the cold front friends. Um, could we write something that generates projects activated in the past month, year, forever? So I think that's the other piece of it, like an emerging center is what tools can we leverage, you know, of simple reports of how do we, how do we do accounting for disk? You know, I'm using Ceph, I can't account like, so I've been pondering the, you know, okay, do I just do it like um, AWS and Azure and say, you know, you get up to this amount and I'm charging you for your quota or am I going to charge for your usage? Because usage is so much harder to, to nail. Um, so I think maybe some of those might be useful. Yeah, I think that's another another point. I it might be useful for us to, just to um, just one of the things I've seen is is that you know a group puts a spreadsheet a, a shared spreadsheet up and people just sign in on whatever topic it is and we could have multiple pages of that of like well how you know how do you do storage what's your quota what's yeah. what's this what's your yeah that was a great great work that somebody glued together from. The mailing that went around and then we got a spreadsheet out of it which really helped me to say wow i offer a terabyte per user right yeah. <laughs> that might be crazy <laughs> yeah yeah and there's there's i mean i know we have the capability survey and that's pretty that's pretty broad mm -hmm. um but i think some some of that you know i've i've been looking into you know for me is like what's the free tier of usage that you offer because right, right. now we you know, as a, a we're a full cost recovery, so we have a, a, an extremely limited amount of free use that we offer. But that means that folks get out of, uh, you know, we we don't have resources for brand new faculty who don't have a startup package. We don't have resources for postdocs or for student groups that we we might want to support. And 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 that you know, honestly, I think we would that would go a, a long way towards getting us some goodwill. So I've been looking at, you know, of the different cost recovery folks that I'm familiar with, what is their free tier usage and finding a pretty wide variation, yeah. uh, at least uh, across uh, right. the different folks. So understand, All just that getting that, you know, getting that shape really helps. 
Yeah. Well, and modeling it against like AWS so that there's parity mm -hmm. is like, well, this is the service we offer and it's at this price. You can go to AWS and get this service and at this price. Um, so that might be an, an interesting one of um, the that pro was, cons. Yeah, that was a, a real useful exercise for me. I actually need to update that. I, I compared all of our services to AWS services and you know, was able to show that you get substantial discount on site for working with us. Obviously you can't scale <laughs> to the same. Right the same site but if you wanted to use gpus and only a couple of them you could use them for way way cheaper than what you would pay for for um you know large m instances on ec2 so mm -hmm. so that's always always handy yeah. to, to demonstrate yeah. value and i think it's finding that parity right of well this is what we can afford and you need more well find the money to go get more because i think that's the other part of how much should i be you know because I put out a, a a customer survey. That that one might be another one is sharing customer surveys. What is the satisfaction surveys? Um, but it's like, well, what if everything, you know, if we had all the money in the world, what would you ask for? More GPUs. And it's like we have a hundred A one hundreds and they're not maxing out right now. So what do you mean? <laughs> no. that, so that's another piece of cognitive dissonance I have also seen. <laughs> I can yeah. I can chime in on that. Yeah, right. yeah. We always hear from more of GPUs, but our usage is not yeah. not along aligned with that. So because I want to use it right now, um, and I don't know if anybody else is having this issue, but the migration from HPC to Jupyter Notebooks kind of um, is the old school versus new school. The students coming in who have never known a command line. Um, what does that mean? And what, how do we need to mold ourselves in this changing, you know, because we still have a number of faculty who are old Fortran coders and, you know, use shell and be done with it. Um, but one of the things that we're finding is everybody's coming in and wanting Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter. And it's like, and why why can't I have 500 uh, GPUs in my Jupyter Notebooks? Like, well, it doesn't work that way. Um, so maybe some educational structure or you know discussion on how do we how do we provide the training or communication for some of these things. We've, we've actually done a little bit of backwards compatibility where we've implemented a scaling cl HPC cluster on our cloud resource so that someone who who just brought over his you know traditional queue work could get stuff done efficiently. So we're, I think it goes in both directions. Yeah. 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 No, uh, to that, I think maybe um, uh, next generation workflows in the capabilities model that where we get dinged massively is we don't have Pegasus or any, you know, it's slurm jobs. What more do you want? Um, so I think that might be one that would be a good one. And this is one of those hard to do because it's probably gonna need more time than that, but maybe a discussion on like next generation workflows and what, what does that look like? I think that's okay, though. I think we could we could try and and put put that out there as something that would come out, uh, you know, in six months to eight months. We try to identify someone who can, you know, yeah. who we can bring in, create a workshop, yeah. yeah, or do it at Perk, do it at Supercomputing. Right, right. So if we have, you know, if we if we have if if we put it out as something that we have some lead time on, we do some development um, to get get some folks interested, then that might be beneficial. Okay. I mean, we've, we've got a lot of bullet points. We've got other folks who have hobby horses that they want to talk about. I'd love to hear them. You know, uh, Rich, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in and, and just to add a, uh, a little bit to what Jeff I may have brought up earlier, but, um, you know, we've been trying to assess how research computing is positioned relative to uh, research divisions and IT divisions. And 
Um, there, there's so many different models. Um, and so uh, one of the things that has been of interest to us is how does one partner if, if you are uh, relying on central IT to, um, to provide resources, how does one partner uh, and partner effectively, um, especially if they don't have a research computing group per se. Um, so that would be, that would be an, you know, especially for small emerging centers or emerging uh, or uh, evolving centers, if you will, I think that might be an interesting topic to explore as well. Yeah. Well, and to dovetail on that, we're looking at creating the uh, sort of philosophy of a support spectrum, commodity to bespoke. And, you know, getting windows installed or getting a printer installed central id can do that all the live long day doing fortran code eh, maybe maybe not and then doing a very specific um, kind of thing and looking at the spectrum of where to, for us it's like we can't support all of research computing so where should we focus our energies we have digital human, uh, humanists, we have uh, imaging folks, we have uh, deep learning folks, we have chemists. And so another one we might wanna look at is how can one navigate that shared responsibility or that shared space of how much do I take on and what should I take on? Because I think that's another one is allocation of, well, I might have one person who's doing you know, past perfect, which is a very, very particular program for museum studies of which like only three people in the entire university care about. It's a service, that's what they're demanding, but where do I get the payout um, is I think one of the challenges. Yeah, just to Kurt to add to your point, I remember talking with uh, with Jane on, on when we were prepping for the, the research software engineering calls, and she she's like, she had said, "Yeah, I think I think probably if we talk about resourcing the you know the just getting you know admins in here and facilitators will probably come before a software engineer. So, you know, how how do we meet those needs as well? So." So I think this area that you were just talking about, the sort of the, where the lines are, and and you know, at, at the university I'm at in Charlotte, I, I don't even necessarily have visibility into sort of pockets of support in the colleges, even though I provide support directly to a whole bunch of people in those colleges. And uh, it's it's uh, it's fairly siloed for. Sort of, I think a combination of historical reasons and it's just the way it works. But uh, I think helping, you know, as a community, understanding how to navigate those those kinds of issues, I think, is a pretty interesting topic. Yeah, the ephemeral graduate student who learned everything became the specialist and then graduated. Right. Um, one of the things that I've been pondering is how can we act as sort of the the handoff captain of the relay of between research students coming through, can we help help, you know, interrogate them or, or help them document their process so that we can then hand it off to the next person. And because we are the constant, which is always here, you know, is there a way we could help facilitate that? Um, not necessarily getting into, oh yeah, we're, we're all in but knowing enough where like for some faculty it's hands off like okay go go do this and then they get everything built on it and then the kid leaves and like oh, now i gotta restart so the right. sawtooth problem <laughs> I mean, your, your point about being all in or not all in there's a i think there's a tendency to try to not make eye contact because you're afraid you're gonna get sucked into mm -hmm. into uh commitments that you don't you can't meet uh, and, and so people don't even want to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So how do you protect yourself? Or and, and I think that well, to be honest, how to take to be honest, how to take a little bit more risk in a way that you feel comfortable with or something. Right. Well, I'll put the safety bumpers on, and I sure. think that one might be a great group discussion of, you know, what you know, service level agreements or memorials of understanding, or you know, 
processes of like offboarding. You, you have somebody graduating. Let's sit down, write some documentation, maybe comment some code um, and having somebody be able to take them through it. Because I think that's the other part is you have a, you know, a chemistry uh, student who figures out how to get this thing to go and then, um, but doesn't know anything about software engineering or documentation. Um, and that's where we can provide our professionalism and okay, here's a good way to document the workflows and things like that. All right, I like hearing this. Alex, you came off mute. I'm gonna call you out because you always have something good to say. Alex is getting a delivery right now, maybe. All right, other topics folks would like to see. I think I think you know, don't don't uh, restrict yourself. If there's stuff that you would want to hear that that we could identify people to bring in to the call, I think there you know there's there's ways to do this. Um, so if there's things that you feel are kind of ask, you know stretching, um, we would we would love to to have that kind of stuff so that we can we can bring in folks to present their things or work with other CARC groups or to... yeah or work with other tracks and do joint uh, discussions. I think Kirk some of the like. Some of the ideas you have about, uh, um, you know, getting monitoring and metrics out of out of XDMOD or cold front would be really good to do jointly with the systems folks. Mm -hmm. I think I think there could be some really good knowledge transfer there. So that would be a good uh, example. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there's always the eternal CMMC NIST 800 Oh boy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what once again well, we return to compliance? This week. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if we've had anybody talk. Well, we did have somebody, and I can't remember was it in the data or in ours, but the new NIH um, data regulations and things like that, data management plans. Yeah, I think that was I think that was in the in the data track. Yeah, um, but I but think as an emerging center, you might want to do highlights. That might be a good one of a mm -hmm. uh, in August uh, highlights of new pain and torment. Yeah, I, so there's a couple of those really that um, could be interesting. It's I mean we'd be a little bit late to the game on on one of them, which is you know developing a cyber infrastructure plan, which is part of the CC Star requirements, right? Yep. But yep. be able to at least have, you know, here's who to here's who to coordinate with. Here's what you want to have in your your CI plan, um, mm -hmm. and then the other one, um, besides a, the data management plan, there's now like a cyber infrastructure professional mentoring plan. Mm -hmm. That's a that's part of I think the CSSI um, requirements so that would be an interesting one to, to so we could have like your tour of supporting documents for writing proposals yeah. well um, I, I think supporting documents and competing um requirements because i think those are the new ones like you know the cmmc level two surprise it's a new one um and just as a like a a report in maybe uh, that we should possibly put together something of a an annual eh, you might want to know about these things <laughs> yeah yeah well we could even do that as a bulletin to them to, to the mailing list and say mm -hmm. you know here, here's all this different stuff that you should be aware of they've changed this they changed that you know we want to support you and and be you know want you to be aware of these things yeah but i think especially in, in a true emerging center like oh bootstrapping what are the what are the hooks you need to start paying attention to?
Okay, and then Claire had had um, to hear about some of the leadership or or champions of the programs where they view what we do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just gonna grab that right out of chat. Thank you, Claire. Yep. Yeah, the view the view from the uh, VPR or CIO. What what should we be saying to you? To... <laughs> Okay, this is this is great stuff. Um, I think what what we may do. Um, this is this is your cue to come up with more ideas because I'm going to lay out what we're going to do next, so we we can go a step back before we go a step forward. Um, what we may do, it's been uh, pretty helpful in the past, has been to to set these up in sort of a ranking and get people's votes on them and use that to steer through. Um, I don't think we might necessarily do like the most the most popular stuff as as fastest, but we want to prioritize those and figure out um, what the you know what what the, the membership wants to see and start reaching out to potential facilitators to um, to bring in some content on some of these things. So I think we can, you know, there are there are folks doing uh, recovery centers that aren't on this call that have a, a fair amount of experience with it. You know, I think um, we could get a couple of different people in to talk about it. I've got a, I've, you know, my, my story is scripted and rehearsed and you guys have already heard it a lot of times, so you don't need to hear it from me, but we can reach out and get some other folks in um, to talk about it. So I think it might be good to identify what folks really want to hear and then um, we'll start reaching out and getting some facilitators and building the program for uh, the, the following uh, year or so. Um, so that would, I would expect to see a, a survey uh, from us where you can vote on your, your favorite topics. So now's the time to get them in <laughs> or formulate further ones because I'm sure we'll have a free response in the survey. So you can, you can bring your additional topics for that as well. But this has been great. Uh, the, like we have a lot of bullet points in the notes, and if folks want to, there's there's been folks sort of working away, clarifying or adding things, and that's really good. I like to see that. So if you have if you have things um, that that you want, you can definitely put them into this uh, document um, or uh, or raise them up when we when we do this survey. So we really appreciate your input on this. What we want to do is have this reflect the interests interests of the membership. So this is your opportunity to, to do that. You know, let us know what are what are important items for you, and then we can um, we can bring those up and share that information. So we're all in different places along the path, and I think that you know being able to share back and forth what's worked or what hasn't. We all have different contexts, so not everything's going to apply universally. But just having that experience of, of being able to share uh, what's what's gone right or wrong and, and what strategies people have used to apply, I think are really, really beneficial. So we really like seeing that. Okay, if does anyone have anything else? Uh, I'm gonna plug one more thing probably and then I think we can give you back 15 minutes This is like yeah, the, the everybody good everybody of Perk, right? Well, so yeah, so um, definitely come to Perk. Um, I, actually, I could plug a couple things. Um, so we're we're gonna have the re RCD Nexus at at Perk um, as a, as a co located event. So be be sure to look into that. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, chairing a, a Birds of a Feather session at Perk about community building activities and what people want to see in terms of sites that are supporting each other, um, looking at how to build out um, networks of support and information sharing. So much like CARC um, with a little bit more of a, of a system spent. So if you see that, um, please uh, feel free to come to that. Uh, there's the uh, 
the OU virtual residency. Thanks, Mike, uh, coming up at the at the end of this month. Um, and uh, for folks who have or uh, or are interested in um, uh, cluster administration, um, I'm also the uh, uh, on the steering committee of the Linux Clusters Institute, and we're bringing our workshops back uh, this August at Dartmouth. We're going to have an introductory workshop followed by an intermediate workshop in October in Cincinnati, followed by early next year, I think January, February um, in Indianapolis, we'll be doing an advanced workshop. So uh, we have some website problems. The website's a mess right now, but we're trying to fix that. But if you're interested in, in getting uh, cluster administration training, or if you know someone that you would like to, uh, to do it, it's very economical, I think, compared to other types of training like Red Hat certifications. It's people really, really like it. And we're really excited about getting back in front of folks. Um, so we'll be having our next, uh, our next workshop in August. You can either contact me um, or check out linuxclustersinstitute.org. As I said, the website's not great. Um, but we, we are taking registrations for the upcoming uh, workshops. Okay, I think uh, we can we can call this one. Thanks everyone everyone for your contributions. We really appreciate it, and we will see you uh, probably at Perk before our next call, which I think will will actually be in August. So um, everyone, take care. Thanks. See you.